What's going on guys? Welcome to NetSec Explain. In this video, I'm going to show you how to find and exploit file inclusion vulnerabilities for web app security testing. When bringing up file inclusion, it's difficult not to talk about these vulnerabilities together. Directory traversal, local file inclusion, and remote file inclusion. While technically separate vulnerabilities, they build off of each other, and if one exists, it's very likely that another does too. When looking for file inclusions, they can only happen when a separate file is being requested as a parameter. In these examples, a file name is being entered in the page parameter. Once we see that, we can run down the list. First, we try to see if we have directory traversal. We test this by entering in these dot dot slash characters to signify going back a directory. If we enter in two, we go up two. From there, we can enter in the relative path to a file in another directory and read it. If we can read that file, then we can move up to the next step and try local file inclusion. We do the same thing, but the difference is that we want to see if the web app will execute a script file. Directory traversals read, local file inclusion is run. Finally, we check to see if it will read and execute a script file from another website. Sometimes this would be a server-side script, but even if we can't execute a server-side file, we may still be able to get it to run an HTML or JavaScript file, which will allow us to attack their users directly. It might sound like a lot, but it's actually really simple. Let's look at each of these in a little more detail. We're going to be using Damn Vulnerable Web App for this demonstration, and before we get started, we're going to want to set the DVWA security setting to low. This will give us the simplest environment to work with. The first thing you want to do with any new application you're trying to break is to get an idea of what the underlying source code looks like. Here, we're simply going to map out the application by clicking on all of the available links and seeing how the application responds. We can see that the URL only changes the page parameter to include the file that we've selected. We also notice that this app is executing the PHP scripts in each file by looking at file 3 and the way that it's able to retrieve our IP address and user agent information. Let's copy the home URL and throw it into Sublime to get a better understanding of what this page is doing. We know that it already has set the page parameters for include.php, file1, file2, and file3.php. From what we can tell so far, the application is taking in this page parameter and then returning the contents of the file requested. Keep in mind that we don't know where on the server these files are being stored, and we only know about the files that we've seen so far. We can take a guess at the name of other files based on the naming convention. For example, is there a file4.php? but it's the way that the files are being requested that I want you to focus on. Because it's using a parameter to get a file name, we could try using a directory traversal to see if we can read other files on the server. For instance, we can enter in a file name with dot dot slash dot dot slash myfile.php. Now, we don't know what directory it's calling from, which makes finding specific files a little tricky, but there is something that we can do instead. By chaining together enough of these, we can backpedal all the way to the root, or C directory. From there, we can craft an absolute path to find specific files and other directories. A common file for real-world attackers to try and access in Linux systems is the Etsy password file. If you're not familiar, reading this file would give you a list of all user accounts on this system. Let's see how this is done. I'm hosting this server on my Windows computer, but I've already created two files in this C Etsy folder. They open backwards, but oh well. This file is sysinfo.php. It's a simple PHP script that prints out the PHP info page. We'll use this to verify if we can execute local PHP scripts using local file inclusion, or LFI for short. This can be dangerous because if we or an attacker are able to upload a PHP backdoor, we would be able to use LFI to find and run it. The other file is secret.txt. This is just to demonstrate how a directory traversal can be used to read files located outside of the web app. Think of it as a replacement for the Etsy password file I was saying earlier. So let's start with secret. Going back to our initial tab, we can just replace myfile.php with etsy secret.txt. This is a part where we also need to guess how many of these path characters we need. It's actually really easy because you can never have too many of these path characters. If it hits the root, it just stays there every time it reads a new set of traversal characters. Looking at the original URL, and assuming that there are a couple more directories under it, we should be good with this. Copy it, and change include.php to our new file name. Looking at the top, we can see shh, 
it's a secret coming from our secret.txt file. And with that, we have just successfully performed a directory traversal attack going from the web application to the C Etsy folder. With this vulnerability, we can use it to read any file on the web server. Now let's try it with sysinfo.php. Boom. Not only do we have read access, but any PHP file we put here will also be executed. We'll see how we can abuse this later when we get into file uploads, but this is good enough for now. Local file inclusion is bad enough, and our only saving grace is that the attacker will need to upload their own files to be executed. Enter remote file inclusion. RFI is even more serious than LFI because an attacker could host their own web server but use your website to run their code. Even if your web app doesn't allow code execution, they could still use it as a jump off point for cross-site scripting, clickjacking, or social engineering attacks. Here's how we test for it. I like to test this in two ways. The first is to see if the vulnerable server can host any web page from a remote server. If it can, that means we already have a vulnerability where the server can be abused by an attacker. This can also lead to what is known as a server-side request forgery, or SSRF attack, which we'll get to in a later video. The second is for the actual remote file inclusion, which is the ability to host server-side code that will be downloaded and interpreted by the vulnerable web server. First, let's look at hosting a remote page. Go to any website you want to use. I'm going to use textfiles.com for myself. Copy the URL and paste it as your file name in the web app. The color is not the best, but you can see that it looks almost exactly like the original website. But if I scroll down, you can see that it's just part of our DVWA web app. Okay, here's another example. MSN.com, the default homepage of Internet Explorer. Again, the look so close to the original that most people could mistake this for the actual website. Now, imagine what would happen if I hosted a fake Facebook login screen or had malicious client-side scripts in the page. Let's try a remote file inclusion. First, you'll need a web server that you control. I just set up a separate server with XAMPP, default installation, nothing too crazy. Notice how the PHP info page says that this is a Linux Ubuntu machine. We'll use this to identify the difference between requesting this page and running our external code on the server. Next, we'll need to host a page with server-side code that can be viewed and interpreted by the vulnerable server. Here, I'm using a simple PHP info page script so that we can compare the previous page hosted by the attacker server and this page to be interpreted by the victim server. Okay. Let's copy the previous PHP info page as our injection string. Notice that it still says this page is being hosted on Linux Ubuntu. This is the vulnerable server reading the PHP page hosted by our attacker server. Nothing new, this is just like the last two examples we saw earlier. Now let's change our PHP page to our TXT page hosting our attacker code. Awesome. Notice that this now says Windows NT which is the system that I was hosting my vulnerable web server on. What we were able to do was host malicious PHP code on our attacker server and pass that to the victim server. From there, the victim server downloaded the code and ran it. That means that if we were able to host a PHP backdoor on our attacker server, then we can pass it to this server and backdoor the machine. So how do we prevent all of this? As I'm sure you've guessed by now, stop trusting user input. If you need to have a parameter to include specific files, whitelist down to only the files you know are legitimate or that you want the user to have access to. Alternatively, you can set a file alias such as page equals one to include file1.php. I'm sure if you really think about it, the user doesn't need to know what file is being accessed. If you do need to dynamically add to that whitelist based on a group of available files, then just dynamically create it, but keep it a whitelist. You'll also want to limit the file selection to a specific directory to avoid directory traversal. Keep in mind, this is not the same as stripping out the dot dot slash characters, as this rarely works as you'd think. Stick with a whitelist and keep it to a specific area, and you're good to go. Well, that's all I have for you guys today. For more information, check out the links in the description below, and don't forget to like and subscribe to see more videos like this. I'll see you next time.